I'm gonna lay down my burdens down by the riverside. Center. 
that had bladder cancer, and they did a surgery on him to replace his colon. And I can remember specifically as I was in the room, he'd asked me to pray for him. I didn't know where he, where, he, where, where he was in his journey with Jesus Christ, but I had that opportunity to share the message with him. And what I remember most of all about praying, it was, I was reminded of it yesterday when I was skiing with Troy and the girls, the Conkle family, that uh, when I pray, I often get down like this and I'll pray, but pretty soon I'm drifting. I'm just drifting into other thoughts and things out of my head. But when I get down and I pray, and I fully get down on my knees like this, I feel a lot of pain because I have an artificial knee, and so I feel the scar tissue uh, start to tear. And I experienced that with you, Troy, yesterday. Uh, so, so, so what happens when I do that, I'm in some pain. And it reminds me, and it keeps me focused. Now, I'm not asking all of you to have your knees replaced or do anything to experience that. But my point is, it, it brought me closer to where I needed to be to communicate with God and to reach Him. I was drawn to uh, John, uh, 3, 3 John 1 and 2. I pray that you may enjoy good health and all may go well with you. Now, Brian passed away two days ago, the person I went to pray for. But he was at peace with where he was. And so, um, when you're asked to pray, get the sincere mode of prayer. It's so easy to drift and put focus on self. All right, a couple announcements. The, the morning class that we do at 9 o'clock is awesome. And again, as I stated last week, it applies to all of us. And we'll all leave with a useful tool to take throughout the week. Also, uh, we have, after church, for the members, we'll vote on the budget. And uh, that should go quick and painless, 20 minutes, because the doors are still open and they're going to remain open. And that's Jesus Christ's plan. As again, you, you, as you have prayer concerns, share them with others. Share them with others and do it in unity. Uh, God answers the prayers. It may not be always in your time, or exactly the way you plan it, that you'll answer. Will you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for this worship service. And Lord, let us just digest everything that's happening here. Take the words, take the music, take the fellowship, Lord God, and just uh, enjoy it and, and see how it works for us through the week with your guidance. It's exciting. These things we ask in your name. Amen. Good. All right, we can all stand to praise the Lord again, so we don't have any movies or anything. Um, so guys, as I, I mentioned last week, we're doing a hymns week, and so the vibe is going to be a little bit different. I, I think if this is the first time here, know that this is not how we usually do worship, but I just wanted to take you, my, my daughter's not here playing the bass, so I said this is a good opportunity to take everybody back to times that a lot of us remember and um, and that I look back at fond, fondly. Um, this first song I'm going to do is called Because He Lives, and I'm just going to sing the first verse and you can join in with me for the first chorus. Because He lives, I can face tomorrow. Because He lives, all fear is gone. Because I know He holds the future And life is worth the living Just because He is All together God sent His Son They call Him Jesus He came
poems are so much easier to follow, it seems like. They just learn them right away. That's beautiful. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and
conservative, I'm a Republican, I'm a Democrat, I'm this or I'm that. I hope all of those labels, whatever they might or might not be, that they're all on the bottom. And the first thing would say, I'm a Christian, first and foremost. That is what defines me. And when we think about Christianity, we think about certainly the person of Jesus. And what Paul does in his, um, in his letter, when we think about, uh, just as an example, as he preaches the, or writes the book of Ephesians, he's talking about the glory of Jesus, especially as it relates to the church. Okay, that's Ephesians. Well, then you can tell when he's pondering. When he writes the Philippians, he's talking about the glory of the gospel and the person of Jesus, especially as it relates to the joy. Think about that in Philippians 4.4. 4. He's in prison and he says, rejoice always. Again, I say rejoice. And we go, wow, Paul. I mean, you're locked up, you're chained up. And yet in the midst of that, we recognize that Jesus is the one that gives us his joy. You can see that in the Gospel of John. Well, then here, as he's writing to the church at Colossae, he is challenging them because they're in a very, um, I would say, hostile environment from a philosophical or a worldly presented thought, if you want to say thought. And, and he writes to them, as you can see on your sheet there, I'm, gonna I'm going to give you a lesson on the supremacy and the sufficiency of the Lord Jesus. And when we think about that, especially in our, um, in our culture, it's no different really than, I would say, in the first century Roman culture, in that one of the, the titles that Jesus was given, or Jesus has, is Jesus is Lord. And we think about that, and we go, okay, that's, that's a phrase that we're used to. But in that culture, you go around, and for them, Caesar is Lord. And they have a, a, a pluralism and a, um, a way in which they were like, hey, if you want to come worship and be a part of, of our religion, and of course, Roman religion was generally imposed, especially Caesar worship, they didn't care. It's, it's interesting in our culture today, what is pretty much the only thing wrong in our culture to believe in as it relates to religion? Jesus. Really, it's Christianity, and why? It's one thing. It's narrow. It's narrow. It's exclusive. Hey, you know what? You want to believe in the things? Hey, what, what, what works for you is right for you. What works for you is great. Believe in anything you want. But don't you dare say that Jesus is the only way. That is the only not allowed. And what Paul begins to do is, you see, he writes to these people, and we're just going to do kind of an overview today of the book, kind of pulling out some things to see the... the um, kind of a general portion of the person of Jesus. Now, uh, we won't necessarily go there, but I have at the top of, of your sheet there, uh, we've covered this before, but in Matthew 16, in the Gospels, Jesus takes the boys. I always talk to the youth group, and I remind them that most of the, of the disciples of the apostles were under 20 years old. We see that in a variety of ways. I won't prove it to you now. But uh, really, apart from Peter and uh Peter was married, but he was the only one. But the rest of them were young, teens. And so he takes the boys on a field trip. And he takes them up north. And he takes them to the heart of, of really this, this, this paganistic um, area known as Caesarea Philippi. There's a temple to Zeus. There's a temple to uh, Augustus, to Caesar. All of it's right there. And he takes them in, in the midst of this pluralistic society, religious society. And he asks a simple question. Hey guys, you know we've been on the we've been on the road here for a while now. You've been you've been intermingling with the crowds, and I've taught here, I've healed here. You guys have seen I've healed the five you know or fed the five thousand. I've healed all sorts of people. A lot of murmuring, whispering, and he says, "Boys, who are people saying that I am?" He asks, I think, the most important question that any human being could ever seek to have an answer for. Who is Jesus? And for them, you know, you, I, we, we, we love them. We relate with them. Because sometimes we're like, Jesus would ask them questions. Are you so dull? Oh, you wicked and perverse generation. Where's your faith? He's talking to the boys here. He's talking to this group that's following around and watching all this. And they still lack a certain amount of faith. And I hope for us in humility, we're not too judgmental. 
because uh, we're that way too. We lack faith at times. We have doubts. And he asks them this question, and they say, well, some say that you're John the Baptist. And when we think about John the Baptist, how, are, how do we characterize John the Baptist? What do we think? Help me out here. Minimalist. He's a minimalist. How so? He just lives out on the desert. He has about honey, locusts. Honey. He's dressed in camel hair, right? Uh, he's eating locusts. There's a good, there's a good biblical diet for all you people. Uh, if you want, you can actually right now. I just saw this. This is a side note. This is just extra credit. Okay. I saw that you can buy locusts and honey protein bars straight from Israel. Biblical food. I was like, wow, okay. And they're not cheap either. So, uh, <laughs> but you get your protein, and you can be as, as powerful as John the Baptist. But we think of John the Baptist as being a fiery preacher, right? He's, he's calling the Pharisees snakes and vipers. Who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? I mean, you see that, that fiery aspect. Well, for Jesus to be associated with him, Jesus must also have had those moments where he was a... Of you know hellfire and brimstone preacher, and we see that in certain places, especially if you think um, if you only see Jesus as being gentle, just read Matthew twenty three, and and he that will challenge you because he excoriates the Pharisees, he calls them snakes, he goes way beyond snakes, vipers, whitewashed tomb or sepulchers, you know it just he just blasts them, and that, that was at the end of his ministry. We'll give him credit. He really reached out to them. Okay, so there's that. Others said, well, Jesus says, who do men say that I am? Well, some say that you're, Job, that you're Jeremiah. Well, what's Jeremiah's nickname? The weeping, the weeping prophet. prophet. And John 11, 35, right? The shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. wept. And so you see the fiery side, the hard attributes, and then over here you see Jesus' tenderness. You see him going up, and they watched him. You see him going up to a leper who was outcast, who would be labeled as unclean and be avoided. And Jesus comes up, and he touches them. He goes into the family that has lost a daughter, and, and or Lazarus is friend, and he weeps with them. Others say... Who do men say that I am? Well, some say you're Elijah. Well, what do we know about Elijah from the Old Testament? Elijah was pretty much, uh, he was a fiery guy, but he was also a miracle worker. And so they're, they're trying to, to understand, because Jesus is pointing it at the boys, and he's saying, who do men say that I am? And so they, you know, that's a pretty easy question, right? Basically, it's, hey, what are the polls saying about who Jesus is? But then Jesus turns it and says, but who do you say that I am? Jesus is not content with you or me giving us the latest polls about what people might or might not think. Jesus is interested in what you individually in your heart have decided and have come to grips with this person. And of course, we, we know that good old Simon Peter Foot in mouth, Peter. But we also give him credit because he was bold. He was usually the first one to speak, sometimes without thinking. In this regard, he says, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon bar -Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. You think about that. You think you're there, and, you're, and, and he speaks it out, and Jesus says, Simon, you didn't learn this from anybody. God, the Father, has come down out of heaven, singled you out, and given you the understanding of who I am. We talk about white privilege. That's like God privilege. We talked about that several sermons ago. Having God privilege. Well, the Father comes down and opens Peter's eyes to understand the person of Jesus. And then he got a little proud, right? He's like, boys, Jesus just called me. Blessed, 
Blessed am I, Simon, son of Jonah. And then really about three verses, four verses later, Jesus says, oh, by the way, guys, thank you, Peter. I appreciate that. I am the son of the living God, but I'm going to go die. And Peter says, no, you aren't. And he goes from this moment of clarity to get behind me, Satan. But what we recognize as we, as we think about that, what Paul is doing here is he's, he's, he's revealing to us and he's going to be asking us, who do you say that Jesus is? And it's interesting because um, in our culture, um, our, let's, let's do it this way. What does our culture say about Jesus? Good teacher. Good teacher. Oh, he's a good teacher. You know what he had to follow? He's a good teacher. What else? He's a good guy. He's a good guy. Look at that guy. Trump's the other cheek. People slap him around. He's offering the other cheek. I mean, he's up there on the cross getting killed. And he says, Father, forgive them. He's just a good all-around guy. He's loving and peaceful. Look at that. Blessed are the merciful, right? You know, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. So here, what they do is we, our culture is such that they participate, if they do at all, at least in you know, what they're thinking, in what we call a buffet religion. Oh, I like that. I don't like that part. Oh, I'll take a little bit of this. I'll take a little bit of the love. I'll take a little bit of the mercy. I'll take a little bit of the turn the other cheek. That all sounds wonderful. But they deliberately say, well, the rest of it, it probably isn't really in the Bible. It's not really true anyway. It's especially, you know, if you look at the scholarship, the New Testament scholars, they often, back in the 1980s, there was a group called the Jesus Seminar. And uh, they had color codes for if Jesus really 100% said this, you know, you'd get a red. Okay, red letter, right? Well, then they'd have yellow or green or black, and they'd say, well, he really didn't say this stuff. And what do you think they chose were the red? All of the nice things that make you feel good inside. God so loved the world. The black is Jesus in Matthew 10, 34. Truly I say to you, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Black, go like that. <laughs> Oh, what about what Jesus says in Luke 13, 3? Unless everyone repents, you will all likewise perish. Black, don't like that. That's pretty serious. We're, we're gonna, certainly he would have never said that. And again, Matthew 10, same passage where he says, Don't fear man who can only kill your body, but you need to fear God who can cast both your body and soul into hell. Black, for sure on that. And so what happens is, is the culture comes in and they want to tell us who Jesus is or they want to define for us what faith is or they want to tell us, like in these guys, what Jesus did or didn't say. And it always comes back to, okay, going back to the garden. Did God really say that? Is that really true? And what Paul does here is he's going to reveal to us that Jesus is the Lord worthy of worship. An absolute allegiance. And as we think about that, we all have, we're all at different stages, if you want to say, or, or growth levels in our, in our walk with the Lord, hopefully. And we all have different understandings, and not only intellectually or, or academically or knowledge ways, in the sense of understanding the person of Jesus, but we also have different experience levels. Some of you have been walking with Jesus for 50, 60 years, and you know him. <coughs> He's walked the journey with you personally. And what Paul's doing, he's going to say, I want to tell you about this person. And what I want to do here is I've given you some things just on your sheet. And where uh, We'll start, but we'll skip the first one, the mystery of God. But I just want to read some highlights here about who he is. In, in, in Colossians chapter 1, think about this. The person of Jesus. Think about us sharing this with the culture who says, yeah, Jesus is a good guy. We like him. We like him when he tells us what we want to hear. Paul says, no way. You don't get the option 
to decide who Jesus is or how you want him to be. In fact, he says he is the image of the invisible God. And it's no different than in John 14 when, when they ask, they said, show us the Father. And Jesus says, Philip, if you see me, you've seen the Father. Who the Father is is who I am. The Father has hard attributes and he has soft attributes. And Jesus says, I am no different. He is the image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn of all creation. It's interesting here. The word firstborn is, we think in terms of chronology. That's not the word here. This is in terms of preeminence. That Jesus is the chief. It, it's really not the word. He is the chief over all creation. And you go, okay. Why? For by him, all things were created. Now, you're walking around with Jesus, the boys. They have no grasp that the guy walking with them on the dusty road is the creator of Genesis 1-1. This is the guy that created everything. And I can imagine Jesus going, hey, how do you guys feel about those, those blueberries? And go, what do you mean? Well, how does it taste? He goes, in, in his mind, he's saying, I made that. Do you like it? How about tomatoes? Don't like those. Okay? And, uh, you could have done a little better on those, Lord, or whatever. But you have what Paul says here, by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth. Visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, these are, these are labels of, if for lack of a better term, to keep it simple, of angelic beings. When Satan appears to tempt Jesus in Matthew 4, Jesus is looking at him and going, I created you. I created you, and when I created you, when you left my hand, you were perfect in beauty. You were perfect in wisdom. I created you with, with the, the most beautiful, besides God himself, the most beautiful creature. And you rebelled. You fell through pride. All these dominions or rulers or angelic beings or cherubim and seraphim, everything you can imagine, Jesus is the creator of all those, whether visible or invisible. All things were created through him, and I wish I underlined it here, for him. Why does the world exist for Jesus? Can you get any higher than that? And you think about why, you know, especially with, well, maybe it doesn't matter the age. Lord, why am I here? What is my purpose? Your purpose is to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. We say glorify God, that's true, that's fine. We certainly believe in a trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit. But what, what Paul is doing here is you think about this. You're not going to see this in the Old Testament. It was, it was hidden in the first verse there that, that the, Jesus is the fulfillment. He's the mystery. And he highlights here right here in Colossians. Don't you know that anything that exists was created by him and it's for him? He is before all things. <coughs> That's pretty serious, 117. And here, and in him all things are held together. You can get into some of the physics of the of the forces of physics, right? The nuclear force, the gravitational force, all these other forces. And they wonder about a lot of these things, especially if you get an understanding dark matter, dark energy. And they go, man, we don't really understand how it's all there. There must be dark matter or else galaxies would fly apart. Well, it says here that Jesus holds all things together. And you imagine that Yours and mine, our very being. Jesus is walking around with the boys. He's like, man, I'm holding you guys together. This very universe exists because I say so. And again, I, and I'm not faulting them because we would be the same way. They're sitting there, they're eating bread with Jesus. 
and they have no idea that he's the glue to everything. And later, their minds are blown at who he is. And we'll get to that in a moment. He is the big, well, verse 18. He is the head of the body, the church. Who's the Lord of this church? We know it's Jesus Christ. He is the beginning, the firstborn, the preeminent one from the dead, the resurrection. That in everything, he might be preeminent. That's kind of a, what does preeminent mean? Pre, we have pre there, that's true. Pre can mean before or foremost. What does he say? Have you guys ever thought, Mondo the eminent one? <laughs> Probably not, right? <laughs> Where's the love at? <laughs> okay. We think of eminence as somebody who's exalted. And certainly the Lord is worthy of that. But here, he's the preeminent one. He's the foremost Highest exalted one, if you want to say it. Paul is just laying it on thick here about the person of Jesus. And this is, again, this is 30 some years later than when Jesus asked the boys, Who are men saying I am? Paul says, I'll answer. You're the preeminent one. You're the one in Philippians 2:10 that every knee will bow, whether in heaven and on earth. All to the glory of the Father. His, his name is above what? All names. All names. I mean, it's, it, it, Paul, you can tell that he's, he's thinking about these things when he's writing not only Philippians, but Colossians and also Ephesians. Because he talks in Ephesians chapter 1 about Jesus being uh, exalted above all principalities and powers and, and others in, in the same way that he's speaking here. That... You know, we might see Michael, the archangel, and go, oh, wow, he might fall down, we might be nervous because he's so glory. And he's like, I got nothing. I'm just wait till you see the Lord Jesus. <laughs> he's the one that's worthy. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross, and then in 2.9, for in him, in Jesus, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Jesus is walking around, and he's walking around, and he's physical. He took on humanity forever. We know that the Father is a spirit, John 4, 24. We know, of course, the Holy Spirit's a spirit. And so when you have this, this they're, they're innate, the Father, Son, and the Spirit, let's go back before the world was, before there was anything physical. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit exist as a non-corporeal, non-physical being. Powerful being. I mean, no surprise. But Jesus comes and takes on humanity. And it says, in him the whole fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And it's fascinating that we know at the birth, we, 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 we sing about Jesus' incarnation, that Jesus' name, his, one of his nicknames is Emmanuel, which means God with us. And they're walking around and they're going, oh, it's Emmanuel. And he's like, you guys have no idea? God is literally right here in the fullness, in bodily form, walking in your midst. And I love when you see the, the, the portrait of Jesus in his humanity, that he is like us in the sense that he's human. Did Jesus ever take a shower? <laughs> the Bible doesn't say. I'm sure he did, right? He might have taken a bath. There you go. I've got a seat. That's a good catch right there. <laughs> Jesus is also, we're going to see some of these as a as, as, Got an overview here. Jesus is the Redeemer. By canceling the record of death that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Paul says, Jesus has redeemed you from the curse. He's also a reconciler. He is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before my eyes. 
as I was looking at this, it's like Jesus is that loving bridegroom. We see this again in Ephesians 5, and talking about the husband and wife there. And he's talking about the mystery of Jesus and his church. And he, and he, he talks about Jesus um, washing the, the, the church or the bride by the word. And here, what's Jesus' heart for us? His desire is to present us holy and without blemish as his bride. And, and he, wants, he wants to show us off. Not so much, I mean, to the Father, yes. But we've got to remember that how many angels are there? Innumerable. That's what Hebrews 12. Innumerable angels. And Jesus says, I'm not right here. You go, man, you did good, Lord. He goes, yeah, you don't know what it was, but I've taken care of that. I have come down to reconcile them, to die for them so that I can purify them. And now we see, it's interesting, in Revelation 19, when it talks about the bride um, making herself ready for the marriage uh, ceremony. It talks about the bride putting on her white garments of purity. Jesus also is the nourisher, not only fast to the head from whom the whole body nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments grows with the growth that is from God. I, I, and you see this again in Ephesians 5, it's very similar, in that Jesus' role to us is to nourish us, to feed us, to care for us. And I, I, I find it fascinating too that you think about Jesus' ministry with the boys and with the rest of the disciples that were following him around. He gets to the end on the night of his betrayal in John 17. And he's praying to the Father. And he says, Father, I have kept them that you've given me. You've given me these boys. I have kept them in your name. And I have lost none except one. Which was who? Jesus. Judas, the son of perdition. But I've kept them in your name, Lord. And then in, in 17.5 he says, Father, glor glorify me with you again with the same glory that we had together before the world was. You get these little insights that Jesus, and, I, and I, you imagine the, the disciples going, what did he say? Something about glory before? And you see little hints in the Gospels where Jesus would say, yeah, before Abraham was, I am. I knew Abraham. He rejoiced to see my day. You see these little aspects. Jesus also was the resurrected one. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And, and again, in that culture, when you're sitting at the right hand, I mean, you'd have a throne like this, you'd have a dais up here, you'd have thrones, and if you got to come... The main throne, if you got to sit on the right side, you were equal. And we know that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God. He's also the glorious victor. Colossians 2.15, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. God comes down, and, and, and I don't have it here, but in, in chapter 1, it talks about us being transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. Jesus is his victor. He has his own kingdom. It's synonymous with the kingdom of God. But not only that, but Jesus says, hey guys, hey kids, my bride, my sons, my daughters, I rescued you from the world, the flesh, and the devil. And you know what? All those enemies took care of it. I publicly humiliated them on the cross. I defeated them. They have no power over you anymore. I, and now that I've given you the Holy Spirit. And that's why Jesus would say, he would tell us, you know, I give you my peace. We talked about this in, in Sunday school. That in this world, John 16, 33, you're going to have what? Tribulation. Tribulation. Trouble. Trials. Adversity. But hey, be of good cheer. 
Take heart. Be courageous. Because I have overcome the world. And we go, oh, that's so great. What does that mean practically? Can these guys touch us without permission? We look at Jesus and we go, oh, man, we love you. We love you, Lord. You have solved, you have taken care of all of this for us. He says to the disciples, hey, guys, I'm going away, but I'm not going to leave you orphans. I've had you from the beginning. We see in, in, in other passages where Jesus, Jesus is talking in John 6, and he says, all that the Father has given me, again, even there, I'm going to lose none. But I will raise him up on the last day. And we go, oh, that's security. That is tremendous peace. If we are true followers of Jesus, we don't need to wonder, am I going to make it on that day? And you see, again, Philippians, he's the same, same image. He says, he, Philippians 1, 6, he who began a good work in you will what? Complete it until the day of redemption. You just go, Paul is just dwelling on all these similar themes. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. I like that Paul doesn't say, you know what, you might appear with them in glory. It's a guarantee. When Jesus appears, if you have made him your entire life, as Jeff said, seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, if you are truly sold out and a follower of Jesus, when Jesus appears in glory, you're going to be right there with him. And we go, that's awesome. That's exciting. Jesus also... It, we'll see it in the Colossians here. We see it in actually all of those books. He's the Lord over our household relationships. And he talks about the husbands and wives. He talks about slaves and masters. He talks about children. When my kids were young, Colossians 3.20, made them memorize it. Obey your parents in all things. For this is well-pleasing to the Lord. And if you, if you are a Christian at 10 or 12 or 14 or whatever, and you've said, yes, Jesus is my Lord. What does Lord mean? What's a good? Master. Master. We don't often use that term, right? What's that? That's good. It's biblical. We'll see that in a minute. What does it really mean? What is, what's another synonym? King. King? I agree. Leader. Because but we don't have a king, right? So we don't really know that we don't live that way. He's a ruler. Boss. Boss. That's kind of what I'm after. <laughs> Jesus is, he's more than that, but he is the boss. The boss tells you what to do, when to do it, how to do it, right? He's the boss. And we call Lord or Master, those are all good. But in our language, well, Jesus is the boss. What does the boss get to do? Anything he wants. Well, what do I have to do? Well, you have to do what the boss says. And so when we think about that, Jesus, or Paul is writing about, to, to again, husbands, wives, family, ch children, and obey your parents and all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord, to the boss. And he summarizes this in 323. Whatever you do, work heartily. This is talking about husbands, wives, and families, kids. Whatever you do, work or do it heartily. As for the Lord and not for mankind or men or, or humans. Knowing that from the Lord, the boss, you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ, the Lord Messiah. We see here as well, masters. He's talking about slaves and bondservants there. Treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. And in 412, we are called slaves. What rights do a slave have? See, Paul is laying on pretty thick here. And he's reminding us, as we saw last week in Luke 17, that we have a duty to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, the boss, the boss man, if you want to say it that way. Now, this is just a glimpse, okay? We're going to go through the, the book. 
But as an overview, when we see the exaltation of Jesus, the question is, so what? Not by, like, so what, so what, but, well, what do I do? And he said, uh, so, therefore, 2.6 says, therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. And here's the question for us. Have we received Jesus Christ as Lord? That's the question. We know it in, in Romans 10, 9 that we confess with our mouth what? Jesus is Lord. Lord. And we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead. And if we do, we'll be saved. And so right there at the beginning, as we go around confessing, Jesus is my boss. Paul says, so walk in him. Be obedient, and we'll see what, what this, he gives a couple different perspectives here. We'll just, I'll just read 315. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. Be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. There it says it again. We're to walk with him. But one of the characteristics of having Jesus as Lord is being thankful. Verse 17, kind of a right in the middle of the laws. It's really good. Whatever you do, think about this. Whatever you do, as you walk out these doors today, whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Giving thanks to God the Father through him. As we walk out and we say, what would always be good is if we had like a t-shirt or maybe something on our head. I'm a Christian. Expect me to act like Jesus in all situations. What do you think, what do you think would happen? Oh yeah, we're going to get tested. Oh really? What about, uh, didn't he say something about turning the other cheek? Psh! What are we supposed to do to our enemies? Love them. Bless them. Pray for them. Just like Jesus did, right? It's not easy. But we know that in the adversity of this life, adversity precedes glory. And Paul had already said that you're going to have glory. When Jesus shows up, he'll be there. And so, what do we do here as well? We'll, just, we'll wrap it up. After all these things, Paul says this, Him we proclaim, warning everyone. Part of the gospel, part of the proclamation is warning people. It's admonishing people. Hey guys, it is right, we've got to be careful here. Is the gospel, Jesus loves you and has a plan for your life. Is that true? Yes. yes. Is it is it the balanced approach? No. Everybody loves to quote John 3.16, right? But even in the midst of that, for God so loved the world, what? That he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish. Whoa, whoa, perish. What are you calling me? A sinner? I'm not calling you anything, honestly. The Bible has a lot to say about you being a sinner and me. But there is a risk. There's a warning. Man, God loves sinners. Isn't that great? So, hey, you're not any different than I am. We're in the same class. It's great that God demonstrates his love that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. But we're here to warn you. Because we always forget John 3, 17 and 18. That God didn't send the Son of the world to condemn the world. But that the world through him would be saved. But if you don't believe in the name of the Son of God, you're condemned already. Jesus says, I don't need to come condemn the world, guys. It's already condemned. I'm here to save it. But we see that the warning 
John the Baptist said this. The warning is what? He who has the Son has life, but he who doesn't acknowledge the Son does not have life, for the wrath of God abides and remains on his head. That's a warning. And it's not, it's not, well, I don't want to say it's not gloomy. It's not, the goal isn't to be gloomy. The, the goal is to offer hope. It's to state the condition. He says, in him we're proclaiming, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. That's the goal. Hey, guys, you have an opportunity. Today is the day of salvation. Paul says, for this reason I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. And as we think about what I want you to do this week, a homework assignment, is when you go home, get out the book, your Bible, or on your phone, it doesn't matter, and read Revelation chapter 5. And here you have the, the tension in, in Revelation chapter 5. You're, we're getting a glimpse of the throne room of God. And the, the attitude is, oh man, the world, these humans, they're in big trouble. We see God's glory and we see their deficiency. And it's, it looks hopeless. And John starts, you know, really crying and weeping because he's like, oh, what? we're in big trouble. And they, the lamb, behold the lamb, the, he, the lion of the tribe of Judah has overcome. And what they do when they see this, the, the supremacy and the sufficiency of this person, of Jesus coming as the Lamb of God, you'll see their response. You'll see that their response is just one of absolute worship and devotion. Worthy is the Lamb. And as we think about just a glimpse, the, this overview of all that Paul is providing for us, the, the question is, who do you say Jesus is? Paul says, I have a lot to say who Jesus is. And I think as we, as we turn our eyes to this person, we just go, man, we're in awe of who he is. We're in awe of what he's done for us. We're in awe that he came down to die in our place. Why? Because he loved us and gave himself for us voluntarily. And as, as, as we think about this, and over the next, I don't know, however many weeks we cover the book of Colossians, and we think about the culture, and the culture wants to bring Jesus down, and we say, no way in a million years. Jesus is our Lord, and he's the boss man, and we're here to obey him. And that's why in Luke 6, 46, Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, and yet do not do the things I say? They're mutually exclusive. If you stand, we'll pray. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity we have to get a portrait of our Savior, our Redeemer, our Lord. He is a King. He is Master. He's the Reconciler. He's the Son of God, the Messiah. He's the Son of Man. We have all of these, these phrases. He's Emmanuel. We thank you, Lord, that we have the privilege of knowing him. Just like Peter, Lord, if we're sitting here this day and we know him, it's because you have opened our eyes. We are blessed to have our eyes opened to call him the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Help us, Lord, as we leave today that we would walk in him, that we walk worthy, that we would obey him because we love him. And we know, Lord, that he loved us first. Pray this all in his name. Amen.